It's time for Cutting Edge Consciousness with Freeman Michaels and Barnett Bain. Thought-provoking discussions and bold ideas from the edge of possibility. And welcome to Cutting Edge Consciousness. Freeman Michaels here. With Barnett Bain. Good moment. Good everyone. moment. Good moment. Wherever you, look, you are in the you world. You look uh, fresh. Feel fresh. You look very fresh. Yeah. I, you know, it's been some weeks now, but I still can't quite get used to the... Uh, the Clean shaven? Uh, yes, it's spiffy. <laughs> it's spiffy. It's spiffy. It's spiffy. Yeah. How are you, uh, Spence? Yes, thumbs up, speaking of spiffy. Thumbs up and a mouthful of orange. It's an attractive sight. It's a good thing this is not television. <laughs> <laughs> but it kind of is. <laughs> kind of we just don't point the camera yeah, towards uh, Spence. Yeah, <laughs> we ought to. We well, ought to. that would be a whole different show. Well, we'd have a whole female demographic that we would be building up. That's right. That would be good, too. Everything <laughs> for the numbers. <laughs> for the num- hey, the numbers on the wives show, people seem to like the wives. They always like the hey, wives. I, I like, <laughs> I like, I like wives. my wife. So for those of yeah. you who haven't tuned in yet, we oh, did our annual years. wives show, um, yeah. which is, I think, always a big hit. People like to see the other, the better side of our Yeah, I saw the <laughs> podcast went up and it had like 300 hits. The first day. Hits and yeah. yeah. Amazing. Yeah, it'll no do well. Time. Well, it was a good show. It is a good show. You know, there is something about the wives that uh, many, many things about the wives, in case you're listening, wives. <laughs> <laughs> many. Uh, Barnett so on his best behavior. So many things, <laughs> about fabulous things about the wives. But the wives, uh, I like how the podcast was titled, you know, that the... Um, that they, I forgot, how was it titled? <laughs> I don't know. I read the title, but I don't remember what I read. I remember that it was very oh, well. Oh, about, was it about the trustworthy thing? No, no it was about, it uh, doesn't matter. Oh, real life love. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It was about how they show up. and uh, The, how the, the blurb, wives. you mean. Not yes, the, the blurb. The title with the blurb, yeah. right. So it was about how they show up, and the wives do indeed show up, and they, um, they have a, a kind of a candor, and they express um, uh, ideas and wisdom. And, I, I'm, what strikes me is it's so unusual. There are so many uh, pundits. There's so much punditry going on. And uh, even in our own area, in our own community, there are so many um, uh, folks whose uh, desire is to be known as experts. Mm. And when did it... I sh- trip on that chord. Uh, I don't notice that. I mean... Well, I, 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 thank you. That, I'm, I'm flattered by that. Anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Less, less so. anymore. It's, you know, I very rarely know. I mean, you know, it's developmental. You, me, it's developmental. There's a place, but, uh, but I, by and large, wasn't there? Certainly, when I look back uh, in my readings over the years, and then my experiences in college and in high school, you would be inspired by ideas. Mm. And, um, what moved the needle on our growth was mm. was the up leveling of us all through ideas and people's value was about their ability to uh, explore deep ideas and to convey them and now m- people seem to more than ever want to be known not for ideas but as experts right we're a go to people and um I, like just i'm an expert how do you get through stuff you know here's this, 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 do this, do this, do this. And there seems to me a very big distinction yeah. between, um, the, um, between having a manual um, for fixing your car or addressing issues in your life and uh, ideas that in tandem with the manual allow you to find meaning and purpose and to... Uh, 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 more than ever, to have a sense of uh, of mission that is uh, n- just not held as tightly as um, experts. That I can well, think life. I can figure. Yeah. Out, I can. I can figure out everything, and then come to me. I'll fix it. Well, it c- what co- one of the books that comes to mind is Carol Dweck's book, which is called Mindset, um, and she talks about the mindset of the learner. And the, which is flexible and always interested and mm-hmm. curious. And then there's this kind of fixed mindset where it's really, uh, it's like your professor or my Fred, if you didn't listen to last week's show, <laughs> where we have this, the know-it-all, the, guy, the part that wants to know. And yeah. if I know, that gives me authority. My information is my authority. Um, and below the authority 
is a desire uh, to feel that you matter, you have a place in the world. It's a, it's a, uh, an antidote to feeling insecure. It's an antidote to... Uh, it's another place to try and make sense of life. But it's a very, very young strategy. Yeah, so it's interesting because where I like this is in the business conversation. Mm -hmm. So much of what I think a lot of businesses are struggling with today is to have space for not knowing. You know, we, we talk these days about innovation. It's so important to innovate um, because the world's changing fast. Whatever technology you're using today, you won't be using it tomorrow, or whatever version you're using, there's gonna be an upgrade, that everything is shifting and changing. And there are things wanting to be born that we can't see from where we are. So you gotta kind of find ways to put down the way you've seen things in the past to, as we've said on the show, wander off the reservation. That's the nature of innovation, is it's not, as we've said before, structured imagination, it's this other imagination. By structured, we mean just repeating other people's songs, other people's movies, a repeat of something that's already been imagined. How do I really get my imagina uh, imagination juiced up? So, you know, tracking back to the Wives Show, mm. we talked about a trustworthy giver, really cleaning up our giving. And I think now, in this context, about Someone who is a really good wanderer, you know, a really reliable, I don't know what the language is, constructive, like they can really wander, and it's like whiteboarding. Well, all who wander are not lost. lost. Somebody, I love somebody that statement, said. yeah. I don't know who that was that said it. You don't? No, do you? Isn't it someone famous? I think it was Spence. <laughs> <laughs> Spence on the morning <laughs> show. If you tuned in, in the morning, it was, it was all Spence who the, wander are not lost. I get all my wisdom from the morning show. Oh, uh, now I'm completely lost. So where are we <laughs> going, Brian? Who do we got today to talk about uh, business and innovation and allowing things to I, be born? And ideas as opposed ideas. to as, as opposed to expertise or, yes. or, or transcending uh, and holding expertise. But uh, we have uh, with us. John J. Murphy, uh, Murphy, and John is the author of Zentrepreneur. I love that I have title. It right here, I'm holding it up for our in-camera studio. Create a culture and of John, innovation. John is, first of all, I know uh, he is uh, extraordinarily and inordinarily um, humble, and I know that because the bio on the back of his book is so small that you need a jeweler's loop. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> we get these long bios. Well, they're... Ba ba <laughs> I like it, a clipped bio. Well, yes, yeah, exactly. What well, does let, he say? Let me see uh, this microchip. So, uh, John is a, uh, an award-winning author and business consultant and a Zentrepreneur. Um, and you know what? We can go through uh, all of the bio, but I would rather just bring him straight on. Um, John J. Murphy, the author of Get Out of the Way and Lead, a Zentrepreneur. We are very, very grateful to have you with us here on Cutting Edge Consciousness. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you both very much. I'm, I'm glad to be here, and um, I'm, I'm working on getting my bio down to one word, but I'm afraid that I might be confused with another John. <laughs> That's nice. That's right. now the bio, your bio is, uh, is, is tight, but and what's really impressive about it um, but um, probably not for your publisher, is that it, the font that is it in, that it's in requires 2020 vision. <laughs> Barnett's getting old, <laughs> so I wouldn't take that as valuable <laughs> feedback. I would just take that as Barnett's perspective. But let me just say, <laughs> just to put all these things in perspective. Please. What speaks loudest, <laughs> what speaks loudest is, is what the book is about, and it is a beautiful book. Um, and um, I congratulate you for it, and I think uh, it has much to say and much to offer for so many, pe for so many people. Well, what we were sort of going towards is this idea of a culture that's innovative versus a culture that's locked into being experts and hanging on to our position and defined by our title or whatever it is, which we see so much in our world. And how do we put that down? I mean, that's my question in my own life. Uh, which Barnett sort of started off with, how do I put down my own desire to say, hey, I'm important. I have, you know, how do we put that down enough to really collaborate with others and really draw out something that's sort of bigger than the sum of its parts, as it were? Do you know what I'm talking about? Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I often refer to it as an awakening. What I do is, you know, I go into to, to businesses and work with business leaders and, and government leaders and organizational leaders uh, to, to, to shift perception and to see things differently. So it's not just looking for what to see, it's learning how to see and how to see in a different way. Um, 
because the data can so often be misleading. You know, you could stand outside and look at the horizon and swear that the world is flat, the Earth is flat, and that it's not moving at all. But, but from a different perspective, the, 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 the Earth is not flat, and it's hurling through space at over 68,000 miles an hour. And you'd, you'd never know that from your personal point of view, your personal perception. And so often that's what's going on in the world, is people are looking at things from their own personal perspective, and they're just not seeing the bigger picture. Well, that's not true. Seeing, yeah. um, that's absolutely true, uh, the bigger picture. And we, we, want to, um, uh, we want to cast our gaze towards the bigger picture without losing sight of the current picture. Uh, but I want to, uh, as you just pointed out so, um, so accurately, uh, we always are, we're always coming from our own perspective. My perspective right now is I am interested in this uh, tension between uh, ideas and expertise, hmm. and I would love to hear. Um, I'd love to hear what any thoughts that may come to you uh, oh, to that I, point. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a wonderful tension. It's like the yin and yang, of course, and it, and both are necessary so that we have contrast. I always say you can't know up if you don't know down, mm -hmm. and you can't know dark if you don't know light. So. Contrast allows us to see things um, in a more complete, holistic way. So when you talk about an expert, and then you also have to consider expertise, there's nothing wrong with seeking expertise and wanting to do well at whatever it is you do. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes an expert then gets in their own way. You know, they, they, Like you talked about earlier, they, they consider themselves the know-it-all. Um, and, and the idea of ideas versus an expert, I, I think both are critical. You know, we've got to wander, and we've got to wonder, both. You know, we've got to explore, and that's the inner entrepreneur in all of us. It's our spirit seeking growth and creative expression. But we also have to execute. We know we have to take our ideas and do something with them. And it isn't that we're going to get them right every time, but we have to at least be willing to take the risk and try, and that's the entrepreneurial piece. But it's also the, 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 ex, the expert, the expertise piece. So I don't see it as an either-or you know, either ideas or expertise. I think it's a very important and. We have to have ideas and pursue expertise because together we get phenomenal uh, manifestations, phenomenal innovations in, in, in products and services uh, that we never had before. And, and that's what they, that, you know, that excites people. And what you were pointing, what Barnett was pointing to in your, your, uh, your addressing is that the tension is actually helpful. You know, um, a lot of times we want to resolve the tension versus how do we allow the tension to change us, right? Just like the challenges in our lives. If we can get curious about them and sort of put down our reactive, you know, sort of mindset and be open to the possibility that there's something on the other side of this, that this is not, that, you know, and again, this is really a matter of perspective or perspectives because one of the things that I think is helpful is to even in our own minds hold more than one perspective. You know, sometimes I talk in terms of part of me. You know, I, I recognize my first reaction as a part of me. So in my reactive world, you know, I just want to say it's this way. I want to draw a conclusion. I want to draw a judgment. But the wiser part of me goes, yeah, but that's not the only perspective. So I can hold what we've referred to on this show as dynamic complexity. I can allow things to be layered with perceptions and meanings and know that I don't know. Um, not putting down what I know entirely, but not being so tied to it where I can't allow for something new to come in, right? Well, yeah, that's exactly right. You know, so often people say, oh, yeah, yeah, I've got an open mind, but they say it in a closed way. You know, they don't, they're not really open. They're not really receptive. They're, they're not really contemplative. Contemplative meaning, like you said, without judgment. So, Tension is a very healthy thing. Without tension, we'd all fall apart. We'd be, we'd be a mess. So we've got to have a healthy amount of tension uh, to do whatever it is we do. Uh, and it's managing that tension in, a, in an optimal way that, that really helps all of us. So I think it's important to be contemplative. And that's why, for example, you know, in, in the book Zentrepreneur, uh, Chapter 2 is titled Why, and Chapter 3 is titled Why Not, meaning... If I've got an idea, which is what Chapter 1's all about, the what-if chapter, if I've got an idea, why not look at it a couple of different ways? Why should I pursue it? 
what's its value? How is it going to make the world a, a better place? Or how is it going to improve things? And then why shouldn't I do it? What are the risks? What, what could go wrong? And it's, and it's designed to be contemplative so that we can recognize the tension that's going to exist. It's not like we're going to avoid it. And, uh, and then we can plan accordingly and be, and be wise about it. So, um, like all uh, par- seemingly paradoxical things in life, it really becomes resolved um, by uh, the dance. It's a dance between ideas and expertise. It's a dance between, there's a dance of, of, of being and doing. And there's a well, dance yes. of and there's a dance of personal uh, personalities or personal realities to mm-hmm. to, to, to borrow from uh, Joe Dispenza, mm-hmm. that you know let's get let's mix it up, you know a big part of what I think most big businesses are challenged with today is it's five white guys in a room making decisions, versus having five old white guys versus having a <coughs> excuse excuse me a dynamic culture. Where ideas can float from everywhere within the organization. We talked about this a little bit with Jim Selman. How do we really begin to allow... Oh, you're such a name dropper. Well, <laughs> he was su- it's such a great show. Because he was talking show. about eldering, <clears throat> where knowledge is passed down. But now in the changing world, knowledge is being passed up. So we have this whole new way, if we can embrace it, of taking in and, and, and seeing things from more than one perspective which creates this creative tension, if you will, where something cool and new can emerge, which will happen after the break. So what I want to do, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I really want to talk a little bit about, uh, I want to talk more about this, getting other ideas on board, but also so often we get locked into outcome in a way that doesn't serve possibility. And that's a part of the conversation I want to explore. I know it's in the book, but we'll talk about it when we get back here on Cutting Edge Consciousness. Stay with us. Welcome back to Cutting Edge Consciousness, thought-provoking discussions and bold ideas from the edge of possibility. And we are glad to have you back. This is Barnett here with Freeman and our guest, author of Zentrepreneur. Zentrepreneur. I don't know where Zentrepreneur <laughs> came from. I don't know what that is. John J. Murphy. Yep. We're back. Okay, so uh, one of the things that we sort of left off with, um, which I want to pick up, but I also want to extend it, is, you know, the... Uh, I, but this actually refers to you, Barnett. In the film industry, mm-hmm. there this creative tension is illustrated in the sort of studio folks who are trying to crunch it down to what they know is going to make them money. Right? We've talked about this before, where there's formulas, and you know, well, can't we get a naked girl in the shot, or how do we get guns into this movie? <laughs> because we know that that. I don't know if we know this, but they think that that's going to work because it's been done before, right? It usually works. It usually <laughs> works, right. <laughs> and and the creatives are saying, no, we want to do it different. We want to create something new. We want to try something new. So try something new is always precarious. And how do we, um, how do we meet in a way that allows innovations to come up but doesn't lose some of what we've done before, right? Well, I'm going to toss that one to, uh, to John. Uh, I have some ideas about how that happens, and, uh, and some of those ideas have been um, backed up by, uh, by John. So, John, what do you, you want to weigh in on that point? Sure, I'd, I'd love to. You know, I, it, at the end of the day, it, it boils down to uh, a sense of inner peace and confidence and poise. And uh, so when we're uh, wandering and wondering and we're being creative, exploring new ground, truth is we really don't know um, where it's going to take us. You know, I, I equate that to, to my days when I, was, uh, when I was playing football and I was a quarterback and I'd walk up the line of scrimmage, you know, and we'd have a play called. We've been practicing it for a long time. Uh, it was part of a game plan. And, you know, you hoped it worked. You think, you thought it would work. But the truth is, when that ball was snapped, you had no idea what was going to happen. You know, you could end up getting hurt. You could lose ground. You could, you could score. And sometimes, you'd, e- and sometimes you'd even audible. Well, sometimes right. you'd get to and the you, line, you'd look at what's happening, and you'd go, no, it isn't going to work. And you'd pull well, something right. out of your hat. 
and sometimes the audible would work, and sometimes it'd make things even worse. <laughs> you know, so, but, but I use that as a metaphor for life, because when we wake up every day, whether we're, uh, you know, we're putting a film together, or we're putting a book together, or we're putting a radio show together, or any, any countless things that we do, um, we, we just don't know what the future holds. So as much as we want to trust facts and data and past practice and past experience, at some point, we have to let go a little bit. We have to trust ourselves and trust one another and, and, and cross that threshold that takes us into the true land of, of, of innovation and uh, creative expression. And, and sometimes we, we get it right, and we've got the next blockbuster, and, and sometimes we don't. But as long as we approach it with learning in mind and, and, um, and that we're going to pick ourselves up and go from there, um, it, it's powerful. And uh, I know that's tough to sell to a lot of people that want to play it safe and they're risk averse and they've just got to make their numbers. Um, but I'm doing it every week in the business world, and it's 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 very very powerful. Well, there is a quality uh, that uh, lives between the words uh, that uh, is in the spaces between uh, everything that you are saying, and that quality is a uh, is is resilience. Um, when people are in an environment that allows them to grow their unique um, properties of resilience, and that is um, in ratios, it's per every individual, uh, they are better equipped to meet the challenges of change. And I have found, and um, I'm interested to hear if that uh, aligns with your own experience, I have found in my industry and in my life um, the resistance to change uh, ha is directly tied to uh, some history of, um, of failure and the repercussions of failure. It is directly tied to certain kinds of blueprints of socialization. There are... Um, inside of which we are free to roam, but when you belly up to the border and put a foot across the border into what is really unknown uh, on an individual basis, then things come up, um, primal fears come up. And to be able to create and foster environments of resilience so people know that they are safe at the edge and that they will not be, they'll be supported by team at the edge and that they will not be um, humiliated and they will not be uh, held accountable for exploration. Uh, they can let loose of, of uh, those fear stories. Then you have an environment that is a truly creative and truly carving out new territory, whether it is in the film business or any business. Yeah. Has that been your experience? Oh, absolutely. And I find everywhere I go that fear is a very powerful demotivator. Now, a lot of people think of it as a motivator, but when we're afraid and when we're stressed out and we're anxious, our cells literally become more vulnerable to dis-ease and disease. And, uh, you know, that's a scientific fact. And we, we actually go into a defensive mode, when, which is when we're most vulnerable. So, so people who are playing it safe in life, it's like driving with the brakes on. You know, it, it's not... Uh, efficient. It's not economical. It's not safe. But we, we do it because we're afraid. So we don't take these risks. We play it safe. And we don't even realize the damage we're doing to ourselves uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually because spirit wants to be free. Spirit, spirit doesn't want to be caged and, and put in a box. It, it wants to be creative and expressive. So we, we've got to learn how to get out of our own way uh, and let go to let flow. And, and, and that is a struggle for a lot of people because of fear. And, uh, and, and fear basically comes from ignorance. We just don't know any better. We don't know what we don't know. And uh, so we play it safe. And so part of being, you know, an awakening, the Zentrepreneur within all of us is, is learning to, uh, to let go and be present because fear is never in the present. Fear is always about something in the future. And uh, when we're actually present, then we, we gain confidence, and we walk up to that line of scrimmage, and we execute whatever it is we have in mind um, with, with, with confidence, with grace, with poise. And we don't, we don't go through life worrying about the outcome. So the word resilient that you used is so powerful because, yeah, um, 
so often we just have to dust ourselves off and try again. <laughs> well, and I think even there's a relationship with the future. Again, so many of us, and we've talked about this on the show before, it's where we're taking our past and throwing it forward and calling that the future. There is a relationship with the unknown that you know allows us to take risks. And, and it has, there's a foundation for it. I mean, you said contemplation. How important it is to be able to contemplate something, to think about it. And, and we talk, of course, of contemplative practices, mindfulness practices, contemplative practices, ways to go inward, ways to source information from, you know, from our body, from our somatic intelligence, not just our head, our head space. Not right? only to source information, yeah. because we typically hold, and certainly in corporate settings, this is uh, almost universal. We hold information as data points uh, mm. that are um, tr transactional and that there are bottom line to these things. Uh, the resources that are in these, um, as, uh, the, one of the distinctions between being, having expertise and having access to ideas is that there is a relationship that out of ideas that begins to, uh, to, to uh, reassess the past um, and w one expression of that is you know I is the present always a result of the past mm. I, th I think I agree with you absolutely both of you in fact uh, uh, we ha have a fear of the future because we um, we are imprinted by our pasts and we take these the past experience we throw it into the future and we call it destiny um, but this ability to be contemplative, to slow it down, and to allow um, forces of our of ourself and beyond ourself and greater ourself to uh, to work with us, allows us to kind of begin to spin off some of those assumptions that we make about our past that we can constantly are living into. So it's a it is a healing process. In the end, uh, everything is a spiritual story mm. it's always a spiritual story so i have a question for you john to this point uh this is your world and you uh have developed uh, an extraordinary career bringing these ideas and practices uh, to corporations have you found as is my intuition that um it is one thing to work with a team and with a group, and uh, th there is impact and results there. But if you can, uh, if you can engage one person in the C-suite, that the entire environment of the organization shifts. Well, yes, I I find, uh, and in fact, I use the term leverage point. I look for leverage points. You know, you give me a lever long enough, I can move the world, so to speak. So, um, and people among other things, are, are critical leverage points. So when you find these influencers and these, uh, these tipping points, so to speak, where um, through a, what I call a constituency for change, through a, a group of very committed, um, inspira inspired and influential people, oh, you can move the masses. There's no question about it. So, you know, when I go into an organization, I'm working with one now that's got 62,000 people, and it's myself and uh, a, a collection of their own people, and I've brought in one colleague now to help. But it's just a couple of us working with a major corporation to influence massive culture change, and it's, the, the results so far have been phenomenal. But it's because we've been able to find those key leverage points and, 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 t and take ideas, like we talked about earlier, and execute them through these critical leverage points and manifest uh, a, a lot of amazing change in a very short period of time. So, and then it just fuels itself. More and more people start speaking up, saying, "How do I get involved?" In it's this? contagious. It's amazing. It's contagious because I mean, I do think there is this, this when we understand the creative process, when we experience it. At least this is my, my how what I've learned, or or what's what's happened for me is, I want more of that. You know the. The audibles, all those moments, all the happy accidents, all the things that where I put down my 
thoughts of how it ought to go. And I found the flow, especially in relationship with other people, where there's a collaborative experience and something pops off. Nothing, back in my acting days, nothing was better than an ensemble performance. And, and, and one that, you know, often those shows, when they started, there was some, you know, people, there is usually a break. Like we start off one way and then something cracks open and this creativity starts to emerge, this kind of space between us. And then everyone's feeding it. And, and that's hard to do in these kind of rigid corporate structures. But, but I think what you and Barnett are both saying is when you can get someone whose lights are on, who gets it, or their lights come on with this, let's put down what we've known in favor of our learning, in favor of possibility, and let's play a little, and let's see what we can come up with. And people get excited about that. And listen, there's nothing wrong with some positive outcomes. You know, We tried it, it worked, that's fun. That initiates you know, more confidence in, in, in trying more stuff, right? Well, that's exactly right. And then what's happening is you're tapping people's inner spirit, what I call the zentrepreneur, and then you're experiencing something I call Zenergy. <laughs> you know, it's just a play on words, of course. But it's this very powerful energy. Um, it, it people, they ask me about it. They're like, I don't, I, I, this is, a, you know, I, I, I came in on Monday and I was skeptical and doubtful and I couldn't believe, you know, we were going to spend a whole week in this room working on this. And, and by the end of the week, people are going, you know, we made more changes this week than we do in a typical year. This is amazing. And it's because we get out of our own way and we allow this very powerful force, this energy, this energy, uh, to flow through us and tap that creative spirit and bring it to life. So the ideas flow, uh, the, the, uh, the, the people flow, the energy flows, and, and we get amazing things done quickly. And then it just feeds on itself. Like you said, it's contagious. Now, how do you uh, create an environment that supports change? Because, as you know, as our listeners know by now, that um, we have breakthrough moments and peak moments, and uh, the key to making that uh, sustainable are uh, is a, a fostering of a relationship with sustaining energies. Uh, and how do you well, create an ongoing process from that? Yeah, you know, it goes back to perspective, because a lot of people have a perspective that, the, that most people, that it's natural to resist change. And in fact, it's just the opposite. From a different perspective, we cannot not change. We're designed for change. Human well, as you say, in, you say in the book, people are designed for change. Yes. So, um, that's, so that sounds, the, you know, the ring of truth of, uh, uh, of that statement is so crystal clear. Uh, and yet, so you're in an organization and you have impact and people are all fired up and ready to go. And then uh, John J. Murphy walks out the door and gets into his car and drives off. And a week later, yeah, what happens you, you, you go from zentropy <laughs> to entropy. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure you've had that happen. I mean, I've done corporate trainings left and, and, and two weeks later, everything is back to the old grind, right? Well, and that's like, it's a lot like habits. You know, uh, and I wrote a book years ago called Habits Die Hard, and, and habits do die hard. So in order to, to change habits, we have to replace them. It's yeah. not like we kill them. We replace them. And, mm -hmm. so, and that takes some time, of mm -hmm. course, mm -hmm. but it's no different for an organization than it is for an individual. You know, a lot of people make resolutions, and they, they, they try to make a change, and they fall back. Uh, you, you see it all the time. Organizations do the same thing if you don't design in sustainability. So as part of what I do is I design in sustainability it's so that, you know, the seeds what have does that to take look like? root. What does it look like? Well, mm -hmm. for, for one, I, I go in and I, I lead from the inside out. So, for example, I, I was on the road 51 out of 52 weeks last year, most of which was with uh, two corporations. Wow. Um, Are you married, I, by the way? <laughs> still married? Are you still married? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not married. <laughs> and my children are all grown up and out of the house. So I, this, this, this so is you're just life. racking up frequent flyer points for them. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting around. <laughs> I get it, yeah. I get it. yeah, so you're on that the road. Of, forgive me for, for digressing. You're on the road for 51 weeks a year. and Yeah, and I'm, I'm actually mentoring, coaching, teaching, leading, facilitating these events. Uh, to the point where when the, uh, and I'm, I'm nurturing people within the organization to replace me so I'm literally putting myself out of work everywhere I go 
by teaching people to fish and rather rather than sell them fish, of course. So um, I'm, I'm teaching them how to do what I do, and I'm, we're designing in the changes into policy and into organizational structure and into procedure. So we're building in standard work, so to speak, so that uh, everyone is trained on the new best practice, loves it because they were part of the design. They were part of the uh, creation That's of the it. key. That's the key. That's, when they, when the they feel like the they're, they're contributing to the vision, that makes it have teeth. Oh yeah, it's not my it's not my process. It's not my That's my right. work. It's it's theirs. That's good. And I just help them get there. And I get them an audience. I get them an audience with the most senior people necessary to approve the policies and 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 bless the uh, the changes we want to make um, and institutionalize them so that they're, they're this is the new way. That's empowering. Uh, That's I, empowering. I got to tell you, I've had people for years tell me, you know what, we've been working on this for three, four, five, seven years. We, we, we just keep running into roadblocks and all these functional turf battles and, and egos and this and that. And what we're getting done now in weeks and months is, is astonishing. And it's because I, I, I am able to get them an audience with the most senior people. And I am able to bring them together from all over the world to, to these events and, uh, and collaborate and use good data. Uh, to, to motivate change. The data so often says that we'd be foolish not to change. That's the way we create the story. So when you talked earlier about data and, and facts and content, that's very important, but without context, without essence, without meaning, it's worthless. So yes, we do go out and we collect the data. I call it the ugly baby sometimes because the data looks pretty brutal. Um, but then we tell a story with the data that motivates everyone uh, in, in involved to, to want to change, not to, to resist it, but to, in fact, demand it, because staying where we are today would be a huge mistake. That's brilliant. Hey, um, speaking of policy, we're coming up against a hard break. Um, we're going to say goodbye, uh, but we would love to be able to uh, continue the conversation. And we also would like folks to be able to, to, to follow you uh, to continue their own uh, experience of Zentrepreneurship. Uh, where, John, can our folks find you? What's the best website or resource? Sure. I, well, thank you. Number one, they can find me live at the... Uh Conscious Life Expo in Los Angeles on February 8th. I will be out your way, and uh, we'll be speaking at that event. Um, I, but I'm also on Facebook. I'm on Twitter as Sage Leader. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. And my website is VentureManagementConsultants.com. That's venture as in nothing ventured, nothing gained. Um, so on VentureManagementConsultants.com, people can see all of the books that I, I've written and the work that I've done. Some, some video clips and such. And, uh, and my contact information is there, so uh, if people want to get in touch with me, they surely can. And we'll make... Uh, I'm, I'm a... Go, and we'll I'm make available. This, yeah, and we'll make it available as well on the Cutting Edge Consciousness website. John, thanks so much for spending time with us today. Thank you both so much. I appreciate it. Cheers. It was a pleasure. Thanks so much. And those of you listening, stay tuned because we'll be right back to wrap things up after these messages here on Cutting Edge Consciousness. <laughs> Welcome back to Cutting Edge Consciousness, thought-provoking discussions and bold ideas from the edge of possibility. And we're back here on Cutting Edge Consciousness. From Michaels here with Barnett Bain. We are back. Feeling my Zentrepreneur. Better Zentrepreneurship inter, than Zentrepreneur. It's, it's a hard one. That's a stumbler. But it's a good term because it means so much. The idea... If not Zen, when? <laughs> if not Zen, If not now, Zen. <laughs> the 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 yeah. confines of business as usual yeah you know and how limiting we've set this up uh collectively and individual like the the idea always from the perspective that we take Brian, is is where do i see the reflection in this collective experience of drawing these lines so tight, you know, the bottom line, the bottom line, whereas can we get more and more space for something more interesting, more compelling to emerge? And it's an interesting tension even within business that they all want to innovate and come up with something new, but then simultaneously they don't want to try anything new. You know, it's kind of like 
I mean, that's a mirror, right? I think so. Uh, the good news is there is so much going on. Mm. Um, there is there is so much happening inside of uh, the business community. There is uh, Raj Sasoda, who will be a guest uh, mm. on our show coming yeah. up. Raj, conscious business and uh, John Mackey, conscious capitalism. Uh, who they co-wrote uh, conscious capitalism. John Mackey, the CEO of Whole Foods, and created a foundation um, called Conscious Business. It's a movement. Uh, there's Richard Branson's B team, uh, mm. which is about, uh, okay, well, uh, all things must pass, and um, the way we do business um, is no exception. Mm. And so what is on the horizon? The Clinton Global Initiative and um, um, the third metric from Ariana Huffington, and, uh, and on and on and on and yeah, on, yeah. World Business Academy, and on and on and on yep. and on. So this is by no means an isolated discussion, and it is happening um, amongst uh, and in, in a synergy uh, with some of the most uh, visible um, success stories mm, on, the planet, on the planet. Absolutely. And, and there's that's an, and there's very a, exciting. And there's a big appetite for it. I mean, you know, it, 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 there's, this, is, this is exciting days. It's bigger than just an appetite. Yeah. Um, we, will, uh, we will implode like a dark, like a black hole. Yeah. Uh, w unless we embrace a change, we'll just get tighter and tighter and denser and denser and smaller and smaller and smaller. Business as usual is less and less um, functional. Um, In my own consciousness, life. <laughs> consciousness um, expands and grows and right. discovers more of, uh, of self, mm. whether, as you pointed out, um, it's a mirror, whether it is on an individual basis or on a worldwide basis, on the transactional basis of uh, the movement of good and service in business uh, or the movement of good and service in, in individuals. Uh, all, there's all, they're all one thing. And mm. eventually the personal process, as we've often said, becomes the global process. Uh, Absolutely. With a certain maturity one realizes that and, and experience it that um, is not a hierarchy. It's simply um, what happens when you're in the game uh, long enough and exploring long enough, enough lights go on and one realizes that um, what is good for me also needs to be uh, good for you and vice versa, that we're no longer isolated. Mm. And, when that, and, and that's equally being discovered and explored in uh, C-suites and boardrooms. And something uh, as a theme too in this show that the forms that we have been so attached to, either forms that we see as the outcomes that are desired or the way things ought to look, um, they are becoming less and less compelling. So there's, a, there's something I've been playing with because this word goals, you know, we just finished the, the New Year's and everyone's setting up their goals and, um, I wrote about this, you may or may not have read it, um, but, but about how goals represent limitations. And yet, it's as far as we can see. I mean, it's like... If it, you hold it as... A, if we hold it that way. Well, see, this is, the, this is the opportunity, is to recognize that this is the forms... So there's this quality of experience I'm looking to create in my life, and here are the forms I could see it taking, mm -hmm. but not holding on so tightly. But what's interesting about that statement... It's a diff distinction you're making between vision and dreams. I have a dream, and I also have a, a superseding vision. Yeah, I don't know if I'm... Uh, maybe. Uh, th that's an interesting way to put it. The, the idea for me is it has to do with uh, something you've said before. It's function versus form. Not versus as in one or the other, but where the two become uh, a, a constructive dance so that if I can really understand what the quality is of personal expression, the quality of interrelation, the quality of value that is coming out of what my, my effort and my attention and my, you know, commitments are the, if I can understand what the core pieces are that I want to promote and, and hold possible outcomes without being so tied to them. Because the challenge I think uh, I have definitely struggled with in my life and I see out there in the world so often is we're so outcome driven. 
we're so defined by, well, what's the outcome? What's the outcome? And I say, well, the outcome is less important than what the outcome represents as a quality, as a personal expression. Again, it, it, this is not a new conversation. What is the function? It's not the form it takes well, that's as important. What might be a new add-on yeah. is we talk about um, form follows function, but we're not architects. Um, and so uh, if form follows function, function follows what? What precedes? Well, I would say something like inspiration or a creative moment. Something, something occurs, and then the function is, is I want to find expression for this. It was sort of a leading question. Cause oh, I, you knew the answer? Because I, <laughs> I, I, I thought you were really asking me. Why are you doing new ideas today? It could be shorter. <laughs> it becomes a shorter inquiry if we say, well, let, let me posit a possibility. Okay. Uh, that there is... There is forms, mm. and before fun, forms is the function of energy, and before the function is pure energy, mm. pure energy um, uh, information, mm. literally energy that is in formation. Mm. Um, and that is that that I, I, that state all by itself is unknown to us. Mm. It's um, unfamiliar to us. So it is, it is, there's an opportunity to begin to develop a relationship now with both form, with also function, and also the, uh, the energy states that happened before that. Mm. With a growing awareness. When we talk about all of these other things down the waterfall, mm that we're really looking to have a connection uh, um, uh, to experience a state of being, which is the carrot, which is the goal all of the time. And that we, uh, as we begin to short circuit the process a little bit, that that quality, that state of being is, um, is what precipitates all of the other stuff. Mm. So if, we learn how to align with that. Right. So you're then we don't have to run the base. We're already at home plate. We don't have to run the bases. Yeah, so there's a consciously, um, it's almost like, so my brain organizes things into familiar ways to hold them, right? That's the nature of how we're conditioned, and that's what we're looking to undo in some way. So what I hear you saying is it's kind of a conscious disorganizing, right? Because we're organizing, yeah. organizing. We're well, let of, me just disorganize a little bit. We're sort of like going, um, our, our friend, friend of the show, Don Miguel Ruiz, mm. he loves to talk about the condor, no, the eagle and the jaguar. So... You know, the jaguar is down on the ground and a subjective experience behind, sees the world from behind eyes and it's very intimate. And then the condor, or the eagle, he says, the eagle and the jaguar, the eagle flies above and it's like a crane shot on a movie set and has an objective overview of the entire thing. Hmm. Uh, you go from the objective to the subjective, the objective to the subjective, hmm. the overview to the point of view, to the overview to the point of view. Um, if we understand that you can resolve the overview and the point of view, and we're doing that back and forth and back and forth in the pursuit of a quality of being, oh, that's it. then yeah. uh, the quality. there is a, 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 a sophistication. It's a, it's a growing. It's not something that's going to happen in an instant, but we, we move our growth towards that, that experience of love that I can tap into the quality of being from the outset and then the experience from the jaguar's point of view is going to be in line with that being state. I love that. And from the eagle's point of view, the overview is going to be in line with that quality of state. That quality of, uh, of that state of being is causal. I love it. And it's, it's, a, it's a quality. I don't even know if that made sense. It barely it makes does. sense to me. It's it so does. much on my edge. Well, no, but the, the, but the part that really makes sense to me is I keep talking about the quality. What's the quality of the experience? What's the quality of expression? What's the quality? What's the state of being within me? And so it's like I'm organizing back. We talk about destiny sometimes, not as just throwing my past in front of me and calling it destiny, but really seeking out, having just a scent, just a thread of destiny possibility. Destiny chosen. 
uh, if we're awake, or it is us throwing out our memory of past hurts and experiences. But chosen even sounds. Future. But chosen even sounds rigid. It's a discovery process. It's an unfolding. It's, it's a, a constant. Choice. Well, there are choices. So conscious equals choice. Now we're at the end of the show, so we're going to have to pick this up at a different moment. And what a way <laughs> to what a way to choose. Yeah, yeah. To This cliffhanger piece. Disorganized. We will pick this up. <laughs> we'll pick this up in another show because this is exciting ground. All right. So we, for those of you who have tuned in, you're going to have to come back. Come back. That's a great way to. So we listen. We've just discovered the cliffhanger format <laughs> um, better late than never thank uh, you all for joining us in cutting edge consciousness we look forward to having you uh, back again and if you enjoy the show keep on coming and uh, tell your friends see you next time <laughs>